Oh, thank you, Laura. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on this Tuesday. I know there's nothing like an early week uh, professional development. So uh, shout out to y'all. Um, also, just as a heads up, we do have a little bit of a thunderstorm going on in the background of me. So you might be hearing just some different clashes and things like that. But um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Hopefully. Um, let's see, Laura, can, can I share my screen? You should have all the power now. Okay. Um, it says sharing is paused. Share. Oh my! Let me let me make you the the, the host um, okay. extraordinaire, and that should give you all the power. And if not, Amelia Brown is on this call, and she is the master of all things Zoom, and I'm sure she will double check me to make sure I'm on track. But hang up. Oh, it looks like is it yep. letting you? Can you all see my screen? We can. Okay, awesome. That's great. Okay, everybody. Um, yeah, so thank you all so much for joining me. Um, there's going to be a couple of links that pop up here. I'll be sure to drop them in the chat as well. Um, and then also you have the option if you have, uh, let's say you have a smartphone, if you just open up your camera app and point it at the QR codes that'll be popping up um, throughout today's presentation, that'll bring you directly to whatever uh, is linked there. So that one happens to bring you to my Twitter page. Um, uh, feel free, if you're on Twitter, give me a follow. I post um, all the things that I research, also some free materials for teachers I post on there. There's links to my contact information, and things like that. So. Uh, and then you have my email address and also my website here. Okay, uh, you can also download all of today's presentation materials, including our handouts. Um, let me go ahead and drop that in the chat real quick. Um, let's see, there it is. So you can you can uh, find all of our uh, all of the presentation materials, including handouts here. Um, it'll sort of look like this. Uh, we're going to talk about these two other PDFs that are here uh, momentarily. Okay, but let me go ahead and bring that up on the screen. Uh, also, you can just look at the QR code here on your on your screen as well to, to see what's going on with that. Okay, so this is what we got going on today. Um, so I'm going to do a quick introduction, go over some goals and objectives. Um, we're going to talk about uh, running performance and specifically what are the specific difficulties that we see um, that students with disabilities have when they go to write something? Then we're going to look at how all those different skills tend to be interrelated in what's called the simple view of writing. And then we'll look at some ways of trying to figure out what exactly is going on um, with your students' writing um, by delivering curriculum-based measures or CBMs. And we'll look at one, two, three, four, five different tasks today that you can administer, that you can uh, score and interpret, okay? So let's see, um, if you have a moment, I'm going to go ahead and drop this link in uh, the chat. Please go ahead and fill it out. You can also go um, and use the QR code here. But if you click on that Google Forms link that I just put in the chat, that's just gonna let me know who we have uh, in the um, uh, attendance today. Uh, many of you went were kind enough to drop in the chat where you're from. This will just let me take a look real quick. So let's just go ahead and take about 30 seconds to fill out that Google form, please. Let me see. Okay. Okay, this is what we got going on here. It looks like um, here's the live results coming in. Um, I don't mean to give anybody PTSD from the election results at all, but this is sort of my big whiteboard. Um, what's it? What's the name of that guy on CNN? John King. Um, I'm not as handy with him on the whiteboard as, as he is. That guy's a maestro, but um, 
looks like we have some administrators, special educators. Those are my people. And then looks like we have some service, service providers as well. Okay. All right, uh, as a quick introduction to myself. So my name is Sean Datchik. I'm an assistant professor of special education here at the University of Iowa. Um, prior to here, so this is my sixth year here. Uh, prior to uh, University of Iowa, I was a faculty member at the University of Vermont uh, in Burlington. Um, if anybody's been to Vermont, you know, very cold winters. Didn't quite get used to the winters down there uh, or up there. Um, and, uh, but before that, I uh, got my PhD in special education from Penn State. And before that, I was a teacher and also district level administrator in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and to put it uh, bluntly, I stunk at teaching writing um, and I knew that I couldn't be alone. Um, so what I mean by that is I felt like that there were some things that I could pull from the shelf for reading or mathematics. And when I did the same for writing, just wasn't there. So uh, the six years that I've been here, I was a faculty member for two years at Vermont and then in grad school for three years. So roughly about 10 years or so, I've just been dedicating my career to trying to figure out one, what are different assessments that teachers can deliver to really help pinpoint what are the exact difficulties for students with disabilities? And then two, what are just simple ways that uh, that teachers, uh, administrators, speech language pathologists, what are some simple things that they can do to try to help improve the writing of students with disabilities? Um, so that's a little bit about myself. I look forward to working with you all today and let's go ahead and start to get into it. So the goals and objectives today is one, I'd like you to be able to define the components of writing by the time we're done with this. Uh, and then two, administer, score and interpret a series of curriculum-based uh, measurement probes or CBM probes for paragraph writing, sentence writing, spelling, and handwriting. Also, I should, uh, should say, if you have any questions at all while I'm going on, definitely feel free to, to drop in the chat. And then uh, I know Laura said that she'll, uh, she'll shout out if uh, there are any questions. I'm more than happy to talk through um, anything that we're talking about today. So let's see. Okay. Unfortunately, what we know about writing is that there is a substantial achievement gap in writing performance between students with and without disabilities. Um, this is from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or the NAEP. Um, this is, these uh, stats are a little dated. So this is from 2002. Um, they just recently administered some new ones, but that data hasn't come out. But if we look at 2002, what we see is that fourth grade elementary age students with disabilities, uh, about 43% score below basic. So what that means is that they struggle substantially with one or more writing skills that hinders their ability to write connected text to a prompt. For example, if they were uh, to be given a prompt of should students uh, be allowed to use cell, phone, cell phones during school, um, they might have a lot of difficulty responding to that task. Um, so that's roughly 43% uh, percent score below basic compared to 11% uh, percent, uh, of students without disabilities. Unfortunately, this gap, so 8th grade, 12th grade, same NAEP, but this time in 2011, that gap tends to widen uh, for older students. So roughly 60% of students with disabilities in 8th grade and 63% of students with disabilities in 12th grade. So what this means, big picture, is that unfortunately, um, the tasks that we value as educators, writing connected text to extended prompts, let's say uh, several paragraphs or pages of uh, narration or essays, students with disabilities by and large struggle with that, unfortunately. If we dig a little deeper and actually uh, look and sort of get a, get a microscope, so to speak, and look at the writing of students with disabilities, we see that they struggle with some specific skills, uh, such as writing output, so just putting uh, words on the page, um, and the quality of their writing. So we think about holistic quality or whether or not the story or essay makes sense or has a central message. Those would be the things that we mean by quality. Sentence fluency. So they tend to write fewer complete sentences than students without disabilities. They struggle with multiple areas of grammar, such as subject verb agreement. Um, they have difficulties with spelling, correct spelling, and then also handwriting. There is some preliminary research out there that also suggests now it's, it also involves typing as well or use of word processing tools. And uh, the age of COVID, I'm sure you all are seeing that. I know that um, I work with our uh, student teachers and also practicum teachers here at the University of Iowa. And 
we see that students with disabilities or receiving special education services really struggle to fully fully participate um, in remote instruction. And I think typing and use of word processing tools is one of the reasons. Um, so why, why um, do students struggle globally with writing and then also in these pinpointed areas? Well, what we know from research is that we can think about writing as falling along these three big buckets and these three big buckets tend to be intertwined. So you have transcription skills, text generation and self-regulation. And these three areas are all competing for working memory. Um, so let's start to unpack these a little bit. So one transcription that refers to handwriting, spelling, typing, word processing, those skills, if students have a solid acquisition and fluency with those skills, it tends to enable them to generate more text and text generation refers to, uh, the, 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 um, the writing or typing, the handwritten or, or typed uh, um, writing um, that is connected text, multiple words strung together that makes sense in the sentences, paragraphs, and so on, extended compositions. So if students can transcribe with, hand, with handwriting, typing, and spelling, connected text into multiple words, phrases, sentences, and to extended composition, they'll need to engage in self-regulation or they'll need to plan their composition, compose it, revise it. And as we know, when we even write, uh, we usually just don't follow those three steps lockstep. We tend to bounce back and forth between all those phases to where we'll, we'll have a plan, we'll start writing, then we'll stop and revise a little bit, check back in on how it's going with our plans. So that's the, the self-regulatory aspects of writing also play a big part in this. And what we know is that all these three areas are competing for how much uh, working memory we have. Um, so we don't have a tremendous amount of memory that we can just dedicate specifically to one aspect of writing. So what I mean by that is that if you struggle or if one of your students struggle with a transcription skill, let's say spelling, more and more of their attention and memory is going towards, oh, am I spelling that right? Does that even make sense? And pretty soon that starts to hinder the amount that they uh, generate text. And that also hinders the amount that they're able to self-regulate between planning, composition, and revision. So what the simple view of writing does, it allows us to take a look and think through, hmm, if my student struggles with an aspect like sentence fluency, let's say text generation, that can also hinder, unfortunately, their transcription and self-regulation because, again, a lot of their memory resources are going towards that one area. So what that means is that as educators, if we have a student that's struggling with writing, so if we think back to these broad measures that we talked about, so if we have one of, uh, you know, if we have an elementary educator um, here um, today or a middle school or secondary, if one of your students is sort of scoring at this below basic, what this means is that it could be a number of things that can all sort of pull and tug on each other. So just because they struggle with writing essays, one of their difficulties could actually be besides just essay organization, it could be this generation of text. So the fact that they're struggling so much with complete sentences, that they're spending so much cognitive resources towards that, that their other aspects of writing tend to falter. So that leads us to, well, what can we do? Uh, one of the things that we can do um, is think about what are ways that we can quickly and efficiently look at students' writing and come up with next steps to, to drive instruction. And one of the best ways of doing that will be going through curriculum-based measurement procedures, or CBM. So CBMs are standardized, efficient, and they're also aligned with instruction. So what I mean by that is today we're going to look at just standard, standardized administration uh, instructions. Um, ways of efficiently uh, scoring them, and then figuring out how, uh, what that task and what that score indicates, what can we use from that to inform our instruction? You know, I'm speaking to special educators, so this won't be anything new. What I hope to provide to you today is just some more specifics um, and what's the latest research on how to administer, um, score, and interpret um, students' uh, performance on CBM measures. Even better, we can use CBMs um, to screen 
So we can screen students to see whether or not they have writing difficulties. We could use it to progress monitor, so towards IEP goals, and we can use it to engage in database decision making. So for example, um, we can go through a process of looking at, let's say these circles are correct writing sequences and these X's are incorrect writing sequences. We can start to think about, huh, okay, this is where they're at before instruction, and then let's see how they're doing once I try something new. Unfortunately, we, we just won't have enough time to go through all the, all the intricacies of database decision making. There are some great online resources though. So I'm gonna drop these uh, in the chat real quick. So you have intensiveintervention.org. Hopefully, let's see. So that'll be one. Uh, intensiveintervention.org is a free resource that provides all sorts of professional development materials. Highly recommend them. And the early writing project, um, that one is pay, um, but we'll talk about that some more later. I think it's a worthwhile investment uh, for roughly a little under $80. It gives you everything you need to engage in all the different CBM tasks that I'll talk about. I also don't have any financial affiliation with either of these. So, um, you know, I'm, it's um, just to be clear about that. Okay, so let's start to look at, well, what are the different CBMs that we can administer to help figure out where our students are at? First up, we're going to start at sort of the higher end or complexity of written expression, and that's going to be at this text generation, so the apex of the pyramid. And we're going to be looking at connected text. So these are for students that um, you have on your caseload, perhaps, that they're working on writing stories or essays, and you're a little bit concerned about whether or not they're stringing together grammatically correct phrases or sentences or paragraphs that make sense. So this would be the progress monitoring writing task to use. So the students need one a CBM WE or CBM written expression probe. And so that's a story starter um, and uh, line paper, pen or pencil. It could also be typed. Um, you need a stopwatch and you need some sort of quiet environment. Um, there's a whole bunch of different story starters. If you look at our, um, if you look back at the Google folder that I shared with you, um, you're going to see these AIM web story starters. And then, so this is from the AIMS web company and there's, geez, I don't know. There's at least over a hundred different story starters that you could potentially use on there. And they're broken down by grade level or I'm sorry, uh, age. Um, so there's cross age. And then there's also some for some younger students and older students. Um, also um, there's the early writing project and let's go ahead and click on that real quick. Um, this is from researchers at the University of Minnesota and Missouri, and I'm a huge fan of what they're doing. Um, if you look at, let's say, learn more, click here to purchase materials. Again, I don't um, receive anything uh, from this, um, but if you uh, go here for 88 bucks, um, they ship this to you and you actually get everything already printed out. So all the story starters, all the CBM probes, um, it also comes with some great how-to. It comes with really um, explicit and intensive um, instructions for how to administer, score, and interpret. So I'm just a huge fan of, of uh, what their materials do. Um, but so you would need, you need um, a CBM WE Pro, pen or pencil, or this could be typed, um, stopwatch, and just some sort of quiet working environment. And then uh, you, would, you would administer the direction. So for example, you could say, today I want you to write a story. I'm going to read you a sentence. I'm going to read a sentence to you first. And then I want you to compose a short story about what happens. You'll have one minute to think about what you'll write and then three minutes to write your story. These times can, can differ. So depending on what the writing task is, like some people give five minutes, some people give 10 minutes. Um, whatever you choose, you just want to stay consistent. Most the most frequently administered uh, administration time would be these one minute think time and three minute um, written composition time. Are there any questions? And then students are right. And at the end, we'd score it. And we're going to talk about three key metrics. So we have total words written, 
uh, that's TWW, you have words spelled correctly, uh, or WSC, and correct writing sequences, CWS. Sorry, I know special education can become sort of this alphabet soup, so I apologize. If I say an acronym that I didn't uh, define earlier, just just uh, give me a shout out on the, on the chat, and I'll be sure to, to clean it up. Um, CWS is probably the best, um, it just has the best research behind it, but let's take a look at TWW and WSC um, real quick. So TWW, we could score what the students write for just total words written. And this is just how much students produce regardless of whether it's appropriate or spelled correctly. So for example, you have Tom likes to play baseball. Total words written would be five, one, two, three, four, five. Even though this is spelled incorrectly, we would still count it. So this is just how much they're producing. What's their, what's their output? Uh, I've definitely had students to where they struggled to even engage in writing anything. So TWW, I'm sure you might have one of those students right now. Um, so this is just a broad indicator on whether or not students are motivated or e even just have some basic skills to put pen to paper or, or to type. Um, so here would be another one. We are in school, or this is skull. We are in school, one, two, three, four. So total words written four. Again, doesn't matter if it's spelled correctly, at least for total words written. And then we also have words spelled correctly, or WSC. And so this is just looking at spelling. So it's not looking at whether or not it even makes sense or whether it's grammatically correct. Um, so for example, I ate, notice the eight here doesn't really make sense. I ate bananas this morning. So I would still count eight as spelled correctly, even though it doesn't make a uh, grammatical or semantic sense there. I'm pretty sure they meant eight like A-T-E. We'd still count it correctly. So uh, they get one, two, bananas is misspelled. So that wouldn't count. This and morning would, are spelled correctly. So that's one, two, three, four. And Sarah went to there. Again, this isn't the right there. Um, Sarah went to their house. One, two, three, four, five. We would just count it correct because it's technically spelled correct. Might not be the right word they were looking for, but it's spe still spelled correct. Okay, so let's say we have this. Um, this handwriting might look uh, similar to maybe somebody you have on your uh, caseload right now. Um, but let's say, uh, I'll read this out loud just uh, so we're all on the same page. Um, so Tom was sitting on, uh, on the chair reading a book about the best haircuts because he wanted a new hairdo. Um, notice how that's spelled like honeydew, um, not necessarily hairdo. Rick was getting what he always gets because he does not like changing stuff up. He's just high and tight, sort of like me, just always the same haircut. Um, and so let's go ahead and practice scoring that. So I'm going to go ahead and drop this in uh, the chat, uh, this link. It's to a Google form, similar to what we've been using. You can also look at uh, and scan this QR code with your phone and score it on your phone if you'd like. But what you're going to do is basically um, look at, at, um, at this passage and then you can try to score and enter in your score to Google form. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you, give you all uh, two minutes to try to score that. So you should see something that's sort of similar to this basically. And so on this first one, you would score total words written. And then I would ask you to score the same passage for correctly spelled words, okay? Let me go ahead and get my timer going.
So I had a question on whether or not we should count uh, the same mistake twice or just one time. Uh, technically speaking, the research rules suggest you count it twice. So you count each incorrect as many times as it happens. However, if you do decide to only count it once, that's fine. Just document your rule and keep it consistent across the probe. So that way, uh, some students don't get it counted more than once, and, and then some students only get it counted once. So the key here is going to be just to keep it consistent. Okie dokie. Let's uh, let's go ahead and and check in on this. Um, let's see what we got. Uh, it looks like some people are still working. That's definitely a okay. Um, looks like we got from total words written. Looks like we got between thirty four and thirty six mostly. And for correctly spelled words, we got a range. So correctly spelled words, we have a bigger twenty nine to thirty four. I don't know about you all, but the, seeing these numbers again, just coming off the election is scaring me. Um, it's just, I spent too much time in front of the TV, I think. But um, so, okay. I think the key here is that our, our uh, scores are going to differ a little bit. So at least this is what I came up with. So for total words written, I have 36. Um, and that's roughly about where people are at. So what and that's what we see in the research as well. So for total words written, we usually get to around ninety percent agreement. We'll never get to hundred percent agreement. There's just hand student handwriting is what it is. So we're going to have sometimes where we're like, oh, I definitely see that, and some people are like, there's no way that that's the word, um, and that's fine. Um, correctly spelled words. Um, what I have is 34 if we count the two misspelled becauses. So here's a because, um, and then here's also another because. Uh, it would be 30 if we count because um, twice, and then also haircuts. Haircuts is technically supposed to be one word. Um, so, but, you know, we could follow and just say, hey, they, this is just a correct spelled word of hair and then cuts. Same with hairdo. So hairdo is technically supposed to be one word of H-A-I-R-D-O, but we could also just give them credit for these two words of this is just hair and do. Um, in the end, it's not that big of a deal because our scores, as you can see, are roughly going to just be a couple off. And that's what we usually find is that when a uh, teacher score, um, that our scores are just going to be slightly different. Nothing we usually don't see anything way far off. If we're below that 90% or below 80%, then we probably need to tighten up our scoring a little bit. But, you know, by and large, it seems like we're, we're, about, uh, we're about at the same place. Okay, so that was one. Th Thank you all so much for doing that. Um, the next one that we're going to look at, so we looked at those two metrics, um, total words written, TWW, and correctly spelled words, or CSW. This... Next one, correct writing sequences or CWS tends to be the one with the strongest research support. So what I mean by that is if we look at students' CWS scores and correlate that with what uh, their achievement on such things as uh, year-end statewide assessments or the NAEP um, or uh, Woodcock-Johnson writing uh, fluency uh, subtest, uh, different measures like that with some solid research behind it. This one tends to be the strongest. So this tends to be the most sensitive. Uh, basically, if you have a student scoring on the low end of correct writing sequences, that means those students might be at risk for low scores on those other measures, like your statewide uh, end of the year writing assessment. Uh, conversely, if students are doing well on these, it tends to increase the probability that, hey, they have some writing skills that are going to carry them into getting a higher score on that statewide assessment. Um, this this metric isn't perfect. Each each of these metrics have their pros and cons, but this tends to be uh, the best, um, so to speak. And I think one of the reasons why is because its scoring accounts for it looks at each adjacent writing unit. So I went, I went. It would look at whether or not the I and the went 
are spelled correctly, whether the I was capitalized, whether or not I had punctuation at the end of my sentence, whether or not uh, the I went and made syn uh, syntactic sense, so it followed rules of grammar, and semantic sense, so it just makes sense. Like I went, let's say I went to the store. And we'd use a little caret symbol to identify each CWS. So let's say, uh, let me read this. Um, so it says, Kathy went on the lake to go fishing. She loved going fishing with friend too. Susan bought, Susan brought fishing poles for Kat, Kat, Katie. I think that's Katie. Katie too. She loved, oh, it looks like there's an S there. Sweet. She loves going fishing with her friends. Okay. So let's say you had a student produce that in a three minute um, curriculum based measurement probe. If I looked at this first line, I think I'd score that 10. So starts with a capital. Uh, so Kathy, you had a point for that. Kathy went, that makes sense, went on. That makes sense on the the lake to, uh, yep, to go, go fishing. That all makes sense. Fishing uh, has a period here. So I'd put a little carrot there too. So they get a point for that. Um, after the period, it looks like they just scribble that out. That's okay. Uh, the capital S, so that'd be 10. Um, so looks like I'd score that first one for 10. Um, let's see. Yeah. Using CWS also shows incremental growth for progress monitoring purpose. Yes, exactly. Uh, Chrissy Rhodes, I couldn't say that better myself. Um, actually, you said that a lot more clearer than I do. So um, yeah. So thank you for that. Um, so here you have a 10 uh, CWS here. Uh, if I look at the next one, the she love, that should probably be she loves going fishing. So uh, it would be the she to love would get an X, love to going would get an X. Going fishing, that makes sense. Fishing with, with friend too. That should probably be with a friend or friends too. So that would get an X around friend because it sort of broke that chain. Um, but the two into the period, that makes sense. Gets a carrot here for starting off with a capital Susan brought fishing. So I get six here. If you notice, this also takes the most time. When we when we scored the TWW and the word spelled correctly, we didn't have to consider or really read carefully what each individual adjacent writing unit uh, said. Um, so this is definitely going to take more time. What research suggests is that um, with the on the three minute tasks, if you get really fluent with this, uh, it, it might take you about a minute to two minutes to score each student writing passage. Um, that's when you start to build it up with practice. Initially, it could take a couple minutes per, per passage. Um, and then if we did the same thing here, I think you get an 11 and then a one here. Okay. So um, it focuses again on adjacent writing units. We look for, it must be spelled correctly. It needs correct capitalization, correct punctuation. It needs to be syntactically correct or have correct grammar. Uh, it needs to make sense or have correct semantics. And then there's also some special rules. So you might need what is called a sentence breaker. So um, I'd ask you to think uh, just in your mind's eye, think about one student that you have on your caseload right now that if you ask them to write something, you would just get one long run on sentence. Um, if you don't have one of those students, uh, I just ask you to use your imagination. Uh, perhaps you have one in the recent past. Um, but if you have one long run on sentence, it could be really difficult to figure out do these grammar rules make sense? Like, should this be um, should this be Susan is going to the store, or is the Robin or Kanisha they mentioned in the you know whatever a couple lines above are they going to the store too? So should this be are instead of is? Anyway, it could get very confusing. So in which case you might have to add in sentence breakers or basically you insert missing missing punctuation in there. And then you just basically count that as an error. So just with your best attempt, you say, okay, this looks like this could be a compound sentence. So I put a period there. And this looks like this could be a compound sentence. So I put a period there. That could make some of the scoring a little easier. Um, but if you do decide to do that, so like, for example, here, if you had this writing passage of it was summer and Jamie, Smitty and Harriet were outside listening to music. Uh, Jamie used the hula hoop, Smitty dance, and Harriet stood on a chair and blew bubbles. It was a lot of fun until the storm came. Um, so originally, this was just all one long run on sentence. So um, you could decide, okay, 
just to make this help this make sense, I'm going to insert just an X here, X here and X here and give them credit for some compound sentences. But to help clarify what some of the grammar issues are, I'm just going to stick these here. If you do decide to use this, you just got to establish some rules and stay consistent. There isn't a whole lot of solid research to suggest on where the sentence breaker should go or anything like that. I would tend to give them more credit than not. So give them credit for like a compound sentence rather than like short, simple sentences. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead and practice that a little bit. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and drop this Google form in the chat. And you can also click on this QR code. So I'll just give you a minute to open that up or a couple seconds to open that up if you wanna open up the QR code with your phone or open up the Google form on your computer. Okay, so you should see something like this. So here's the entire student writing sample. And then I'm gonna ask you to score section one. So um, score everything here and then type in how many correct writing sequences you think. And then, but don't score after two yet here. So don't add a point or an X after here yet. Um, just pick it up on the next one. Um, so score before music, um, but then also don't score after A. So what I'm basically asking you to do is don't score that end part yet for a section one, don't score that end part yet for section two, and then section three should be fine. Okay. I'm going to give you a little bit longer for this one. Uh, I'm going to give you a little over two minutes to score that. Um, I'll be looking at the chat, so let me know if you have any questions in the meantime. I'll also bring up... Uh, these uh, CWS rules, at least these brief rules. Okie dokie, everybody. Looks like we got some scores coming in. Okay, this is what I came up with for them. There's no one right answer. 
On this first one, I came up with 11 for this first section. So one, it, I get start off with a capital. Um, so at the beginning, so I'd start off with one here, it. It was, was summer, summer and, and Janice. Oh, it looks like they had a punctuation mark here. Smitty and Harriet were outside and then I put the X's around uh, listening because that was misspelled. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So I gave them a point here around the comma between Janice and Smitty. I gave them that point. Uh-oh, looks like a little unclear on where to type in the score. Hopefully, uh, yeah, sorry. I know it can, it can be a little difficult on, um, on administering some of these uh, online, but let's take a look. So at least for, oops. That's not the one. There you go. So at least for here, for section one, you would you would type in your answer right over here. Section two, type in your answer right here. Section three would be right here. So unfortunately, I wish I had the ability to have you actually click in like air, carrots in between each word, but just didn't have that. So uh, you would have to probably have a, I don't know, maybe something to write down or maybe a, like a Word doc open to to help score this. Looks like I had some questions here. Um, let's see. Do you not give points for capitalization of names? Yeah, I would. Um, so uh, at least for um, right between the and and Janice, I would give a capital here. Um, and then I'd give a point for, I'm sorry, I'd give a point for uh, Janice. But it would still just be between and and Janice would just count as one point. So they wouldn't get another point for it being a capital, It'd just be for for one here. Um, Harriet, where it starts to become tricky, like Harriet, that's a clear uppercase H, right? For things like Smitty or an S where the lowercase and uppercase really just differs based off of size, especially for handwriting, that can get pretty tricky. Um, I tend to lean towards giving students the point if I think it's a capital letter, um, but whatever you decide, you just need to stay consistent with that. Um, so I had, at least for so only possibly one point between each word. Yep. Yep, exactly. So, um, or it could be uh, like a, if say Janice, Janice between Janice and Smitty. So it would be a point between at the end of E to the comma here. And then they would get another point on the other end of the comma to Smitty. It looked to me as though S was capitalized on summer. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Again, it can be really tricky. It's, um, I tend to go towards being more lenient with the scoring for capitalization. Cause again, with handwriting being what it is, it can be difficult. It being a time task as well. Students could just be getting a little bit more sloppy, so to speak with their handwriting. Um, I think the key here though, is that you can make those decisions um, for your scoring. If you decide to hold a really hard line, so to speak on capitalization, stick with it, be consistent, and then run that across your probes. Um, speaking just from a uh, uh, practitioner side, it's that I tended to keep a pretty lenient score on capitalization versus lowercase. However, I would make note to myself like a running record on, okay, this student has difficulty with capitalization, so I'll have to work with them on that. Because again, these um, CBM uh, metrics they become really meaningful when, when you use them to drive instruction. So um, just because our scores might fluctuate here or there a little bit, overall, I think it, it would have a, a, some clear implications for what you would focus in on for teaching. Yeah, so Chrissy said, my rule usually is if the capital and lowercase are the same, I give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah, but like there's some, there's some, um, there's some letters that I think are a little easier that have distinct differences between upper and lower case. So that's uh, this CWS is so complicated that um, let's try it all again. So uh, let's have another fun, fun exercise of scoring for CWS. So um, let me go ahead and drop this in the chat. Let's see. 
So you have that. You also have um, this QR code here. So I'll, I'll put that up there for a little bit in case anybody's doing this over their phone. And you should see something that looks like this. So you have this entire writing sample. Janice was using the hula hoop while Smitty was dancing to the music. I think that's a period, um, but our scores are probably going to differ a little bit. And Harriet was on a small chair blowing bubbles. I think that's a period again. They had so much fun. And then so I'd ask you to score this first section. Oh, that those those directions are a little off where it says don't score for after two yet. Don't score for after dancing yet on here. Um, and then here it was on a small chair and then here. So these uh, section two directions are a little off, but uh, what I'm basically asking you to do is just don't score for the end of dancing here yet. Don't score for the end of chair here yet. And then section three, you can score for whatever. Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, give you all some time, time with that, just, uh, just about two minutes. And then I'll be looking at the chat in case you all have any questions. For those of you wrapping up, I, I placed uh, at least my scores. Um, again, our scores can differ a little bit. That's definitely okay. What we tend to find is that for CWS, we tend to get a little bit lower um, agreement than total words written, but we tend to try to get uh, above 80% agreement. Looks like for section one, the majority of people scored nine. Um, plus or minus one or two. That's okay. For the second section, 11, most people scored 10, plus or minus one or two. That's okay. And section three, most people scored eight, plus or minus one. Um, so that's okay too. So what we tend, what we, what uh, we're going to see is that for correct writing sequences, as you can tell, it's going to take, it takes more time. Um, our scores are going to fluctuate a little bit. Uh, but if we did this right, if we just did some more practice, um, I'm confident that we would get to roughly 80 to 100% agreement uh, across different practice probes. And that's what we find. Okay, so um, if you decide a uh, research recommendation is to use CWS. Um, so you can use total words written and, cor and uh, correctly spelled words. That's completely fine, particularly if you have some students whose spelling is an issue are just putting, uh, are just generating writing output. Those other two measures are completely fine. If you want something that has a little bit more bang for the buck, so to speak, CWS, since it looks at really everything, uh, spelling, uh, 
uh, legibility of your handwriting, uh, grammar and usage, semantics. Um, if you use CWS, there's um, it, it tends to it tends to inform your practice a little bit more. Um, it's best if you can, uh, if you work at a school, if you're on a school building committee, um, to try to establish some local norms. So what I mean by that is you actually administer uh, this writing task, uh, like a curriculum-based uh, uh, curriculum uh, measurement of written expression or CBMWE, and you administer to as many kids as you can in your school or your class, and then you start to rank them rank the scores in the percentiles of like 10th percentile, 25th, 50th, 75th, 90th. Or you could also use national norms. The national norms might not fit exactly what's going on in your school. So they could be slightly lower than what's in your school or slightly higher. Um, as special educators, you probably want to know what level does my student need to reach that's going to allow them to keep pace with their peers in the general education classroom. So that's a great question to ask yourself. If that's what you want to answer, it's, you probably need some sort of data from the general education classroom. So that's why local norms tend to be the best. Um, but here are some, uh, these are from Ames Web. Um, so here's first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. Here's the percentile. So let's say you have a third grader, 50th percentile. So on average, a third grader, let's see, we're a little bit past the fall, we're at the winter. On that three-minute uh, CBMWE, roughly, uh, on average, students will score 24 correct writing sequences. Okay, and then fourth grade, I also have fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. So there's some good research behind these uh, national norms. So that they're a part of um, the PowerPoint that's posted on the Google Drive. Um, but yeah, so you could compare your students' writing performance to where they would roughly fall uh, in relation to their grade level. Okay, so that's uh, the one writing task. We're going to switch gears a little bit and look at CBMPW, our curriculum-based measurement picture word. And this tends to be slightly less complex to where CBMWE was for paragraph level and above. Um, so that's students working on stories or essays. This tends to be if you have a student that's just struggling with the basics of a complete sentence. Um, I definitely had a lot of students like that. And so this CBM PW would be the task to administer. So you would need picture word prompts. So basically where you have like a picture and a word that students could use, some sort of writing utensil, um, and you would need a timer and a quiet location. Uh, again, if you go to the earlywritingproject.org, uh, where are we at? They actually, as a part of their binder that you can purchase, they have um, all the probes already made up. Um, again, I've worked with a number of schools here, even in, I'm in Iowa City, Iowa. And uh, I know several special educators who have just purchased the bundle or they've asked their principal to buy it. Um, there, yeah, I, I just think it's a wonderful set. So it saves you a lot of time from having to find picture word prompts. If you're around for my presentation next week, I also have a bunch of picture word, word prompts posted for free on my website that I'll talk uh, through a little bit more next week. Um, so you uh, provide students with that CBM PW, and then you read the administration direction. So uh, for example, it could be it's time to write some sentences. You're going to write a good sentence for each picture. When you reach the end of a page, continue on to the next page, and then you sort of show students. Keep writing until I ask you to stop. Before we begin, let's read each word. So you just sort of flip through and look at the picture and read the word. Uh, now turn back to the first page. When I say begin, write one sentence for each picture, and then they will get three minutes. And you could score these the exact same way with some slight variations for, you could score that for total words written and also words spelled correctly, same thing. Uh, the correct writing sequences is gonna be a little different. So we're really gonna focus in on the context of a sentence. Again, if you've ever delivered one of those story starters, so for example, let's say you, gave students one of these story starters tours. I couldn't fall asleep in my tent. I heard this noise outside and dot, dot, dot. And they wrote one long run on sentence story. Again, it can be very difficult to figure out, okay, Bob that was mentioned a couple lines before, 
is he also going to the store? Um, in which case, maybe runs doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I can't really tell because there's no puncture. It's just one long run on thing. Um, in which case, they might get that scored correctly, the Tom and runs, because you're just thinking, I don't, I don't think Bob's a part of this. Um, but for here, since they're responding to each individual picture, you're going to really focus in on this specific sentence is Bob and Tom going to the store? In which case the grammar and usage rules become so much clearer when you're using this picture word. So when you're thinking about that to your, when you're thinking right now, huh? Like I have a student to where they keep making grammar mistakes in their writing. This uh, type of writing task would be a crystal clear way of figuring out, uh, you know, whether they have difficulties with those grammar and usage rules, or is it because they just have some run on sentences that, and when they're writing essays that maybe they're okay with it, they just need some more editing. Um, so, but again, we're looking for spelling, capitalization and punctuation, syntax and semantics, same things for CWS. Um, and then there's also some more uh, detailed rules and the early writing project binder that you purchase that that you can purchase has a detailed description of all these rules but for so for example spelling compound words written as two words are incorrect so sort of like that hairdo that we saw earlier it would just need to be the one word uh, first letter of a sentence and proper nouns need to be capitalized if a quotation is attempted capitalization counts ignore all other capitalizations Punctuation, final word, and, and last sentence of a probe does not count for capitalization. Uh, if a quotation is attempted, then punctuation counts. If an apostrophe is attempted, then it counts as correct or incorrect. Uh, slang or colloquialisms are counted as incorrect. And here's uh, one of the important things is that word prompts do not need to be included. So what I mean by that is just because this word is horse over here, they don't necessarily have to use that word horse. Um, they could just say he jumped into the sky and that would be fine. They don't have to use the word horse. So there's no points attached to using that word prompt. So here would be an example. So let's say if uh, the student saw this and they wrote the man eats a hot dog, that would be an incorrect to start because you need to start off a sentence with a capital letter. The man makes sense. Man eats, eats a, a hot dog. And they also get in between uh, the G and the period as a point because they get a point for that um, period. Um, let's say they saw this and said the moon are funny. Um, again, we're looking at the sentence. So it needs to be the moon is funny for it to be grammatically correct here. And so, so let's take a look uh, at these. Let's practice scoring. Um, I have these four on here. So what I'm going to do is drop this Google form in the chat or you could use the QR code here. I'll go ahead and keep this up here for a couple seconds um, while you all open that form up. And what you're going to see is something like this to where, oh geez, it looks like they just copied and pasted the, sorry about that. You just need to ignore um, where it says don't score for you just basically need to ignore these uh, little small rules underneath. And you just score this section, section one, section two, section three, section four. So try to uh, type in the correct writing, the number of correct writing sequences right here in the little answer fields, okay? And I'll go ahead and give you all about two minutes for that. Sean, do you mind checking? That didn't pop up in my chat, this last one. The rest uh -oh. of them all have. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. Looks like I sent it to one person. <laughs> Let me see. Thanks. Sir. Was that uh, Laura? Let's see. Yes. Okay. I see it now. Thank you. All right. Thank you. These practice opportunities are fantastic. Thanks, Sean. Oh, awesome, yeah. Sorry for, uh, I didn't realize they uh, basically just copied over the little mini directions here, so please ignore that, but hopefully this helps.
Okie dokie, everybody. Uh, I know some of y'all might still be finishing up. That's definitely okay. Here's what I have for some of these. So this first one, I had a three. So Simon draws A, and then I put a X around picture. I have seen some people go ahead and give the student credit for having a period there um, and just sort of tossed on a point. Um, that's okay if you did that. Our scores would only differ by one. Um, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's see, section two, I have uh, two, and that's the majority of, so the majority of people scored the first one, Simon draws a picture, uh, three, uh, plus or minus one. Uh, let's see, section two, I have two, most people scored that, two, uh, some people scored it a three. Let's see, next one, I have it as three. Um, let's see. I, so I have the man hide behind tree. Uh, so I think that this should probably be the man hides behind a tree. Um, or it could be hides behind the tree or something. Something's missing between behind and tree or head. Yeah, exactly. It could be the man hid behind. Yeah. Um, so I would do one, two, and then three here at the end. So I, at least for me, I'd give I'd give uh, this kiddo a three. Um, let's see. And then the horse jumped up and down. Um, I gave that a four. So one, two, three, four. So jumped is spelled incorrectly. Up and and down. And then I put an X at the end there after the down. So they got one, two, three, four. Again, most people score that a four plus or minus one. Um, so what we're seeing is, again, sort of follows out with what we're seeing across larger research studies or when we work with uh, larger schools, um, tend to be clustered around a, a similar score, plus or minus one or two. Okay, so if you were to do this, um, same thing with CBMWE or the paragraph level one. Uh, we would want a recommendation is for you to establish local norms because again, as special educators, what you're inter interested in is what skills do my students need to be able to keep pace with the general education classroom. So local norms tend to be the most informative for that. Um, so you can set up those similarly to how you do uh, CBMWE. In fact, when I've worked with schools um, to save time, uh, I'd basically just schedule out uh, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the beginning uh, of of uh, beginning of a certain school period across the school, and I just have students complete uh, CBMWE, CBM uh, picture word, um, just one one a day for three days to give me some really good information. Or you can use norms from the early writing project. So um, right now we only have uh, some solid norms for first, second, and third grade for. Uh, scoring correct writing sequences for those picture words. So for example, if you have a third grader roughly at the 50th percentile, uh, let's say at winter, they're all the way up to 39 correct writing sequences on those picture words. These, uh, these norms are still being developed. Um, the, the great thing is, is that if you do go with the early writing project, um, they are in the process of doing more really great research on updating these norms, and um, they also have some um, some exciting stuff coming out to where they're looking at norms for students who are English language learners, because um, what we know for students uh, who are English language learners is that their writing fluency tends to grow at a slightly different trajectory, um, which makes sense. Um, at least for English writing fluency. And um, so, yeah, so here's uh, the norms for, for uh, picture word, um, correct writing sequences. And then, so we started off with at sort of the more complex, the paragraph level essays or narratives. Then we dropped down a little bit to specifically sentences. And now let's actually drill down even more to your like, actually, I don't have students who are <laughs> ready to do essays or narratives or sentences. They're just spelling is so difficult for them. I want to focus then on that. And there are procedures for that as well. So in this transcription, so we were working basically at this text generation part of the simple view of writing, where now we're down here at the transcription and we're specifically work looking at the word level. So you would need a spelling probe. So just basically a line paper, a pen or pencil. You could also do this um, online. In fact, I've seen teachers deliver this via uh, Google Classroom. Um, and then so you need a spelling list, stopwatch, and just some sort of quiet environment. 
Um, there are spelling lists, um, but they all cost money right now. Um, so Ames Web, um, also they have pre-printed lists that you can use uh, by grade level. Also the early writing project um, as a part of that binder that, that, um, that I'd recommend purchasing. Uh, where are you? Oh yeah, here you are. So uh, this part of this binder, this DBI bundle, um, that comes with the spelling probes already made. Or you could even create your own spelling probes. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, that's going to have to be probably a school building committee to where you come up with what word you want at each grade level. Um, and then you just need to sort of craft the number of words per list to make sure you have about 20 of them. And they're roughly the words are about similar length. And then you would uh, administer. Um, so it could go something like, I'm going to read, you, read some words to you. I want you to write the words on the sheet in front of you. Write the first word on the first line, the second word on the second line, and so on. I'll give you 10 seconds to spell each word. When I say the next word, try to write it, even if you haven't finished the last one. Are there any questions? And then you would basically score it. This time, uh, you could score this for total words written um, or correctly spelled words. Um, that would still hold. Um, the total words written wouldn't make a whole lot of sense just because since total words written is just correct or incorrect spelling, I guess that's just for if you have students writing nothing, uh, the fact that they're writing something could be a win. I've definitely had students like that. Um, the correct letter sequences tend to be the most sensitive. Uh, that's because you're really giving them credit for each adjacent letter. So it's really similar to correct writing sequences, except now you're just looking at a letter by letter basis. So beginning space of the first letter in between each letter, and you also get credit for punctuation if that's appropriate. So proper nouns need to be capitalized. Compound words must not have a space. So downhill is awesome. Down and then hill, not so awesome. Um, extra letters at the beginning and end are not counted. Uh, for hyphenated words, father-in-law spaces before and after hyphens are counted. So let's take a look at this. So let's say if we said the word animal and they started off strong, they get a point for the A, the M, I, N, a is incorrect, but the A to the L is correct. And then so they would get three points total for this one. Carry, carry, that's correct, sweet. They get six starting off at the end and in between each letter sequence. Uh, four got um, here, F, F, O. Okay, sweet, that's starting off strong, but then they don't pick up anything for this O, U, R. And then the got part is correct. So they get six for this one. Uh, each, each, uh, at least they start at the beginning and the end. Um, jealous, gel, aus. Um, so they would get some points here for the L-O-U-S. So basically what you're doing is giving them credit for having something. Um, where this becomes not only, I think, is practically for motivation for students to at least try something. So I've scored correct spelled words before in this and um, sticking at that high level if a student just doesn't know how to spell it they'll forget it um, but at least for this you're giving them some credit for some of the letters so that tends to increase motivation so let's say if you had sheriff and you saw this uh, student response wise wise speak speak sister-in-law sister-in-law phone phone october don't so let's go ahead and we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I think we can squeeze in just a couple minutes of scoring practice. If I did this right this time, that form should go to everybody. Yep. And you're going to see, let's see. Something like this. So where you have the list of dictated words um, and then here's sheriff, here's wise, here, speak. So let's go ahead and at least try to score the first three. I'll go ahead and start a timer um, just for two minutes. And then I'll be monitoring the chat if you have any questions. So again, we're looking at correct letter sequences. So they start off with a point off the bat if they if they have the, the correct letter up front. And I'll put on I'll put these examples up here just to give you a little bit of guidance.
if uh, you don't finish, that's okay. We got a little bit less than a minute left. Thanks so much for hanging in there with me with all the Google forms. I know uh, there's nothing quite like uh, teaching all day and then coming to a PD where you're working. So thank you all so much for practicing these with me. The practice is fantastic. So we appreciate the opportunity. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Okie dokie. All right. Excuse me, everybody. Okay. I got a uh, got um got some chats from some of y'all where it's dismissal time. So uh, best of luck with dismissal time. Sorry. <laughs> I know uh, that could be sort of a, a hectic time. So um, especially now with uh, the age of COVID. So uh, stay safe out there. Um, let's see. Okay, so at least for this is what I came up with. So for sheriff, uh, I have um, starting off with a S between the S and the H, the E, the R, and then they miss some of this. And then I gave them a point here for the end. F uh, Ys, they basically got everything except that S. Same with speak, they're missing that A. Uh, Sister-in-law, they're missing the one hyphen, but they basically got everything else. Uh, phone. Uh, same thing, just missing that PH, but they got everything else. October, and then don't, they're missing that, uh, that apostrophe, but they got everything else there. Okay. So uh, similar, you can, it's again recommendation to establish some local norms, but you can also use national norms. So these are from AmesWeb. I have from first through eighth grade. So for example, let's say you have a third grader at the 50th percentile um, in the winter, it would be 94 correct letter sequences roughly is what we're looking at. Okay, so that's um, CBM spelling. And that brings us to our last one. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions. And I, I could be on here um, if you have any questions. Let's see, would October be seven or eight? That's, that's a good question. Let's see. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, and then looks like I forgot to add on one at the end there. Um, so there should be one more here. So that'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good catch. Looks like some of these just got shifted over, but good catch. This I know I'm dealing with some teachers. This is this is good. Okay, so um, let's see. So that'd be uh, correct letter sequences. And then that brings us to the last one, which would be uh, copy and alphabet tasks for handwriting. So this would be at the transcription level. So they, this would be, um, so we started off with paragraph level uh, narratives, essays, then we looked at sentences, then we looked at specific words for spelling. Now we're looking at just letters. So can you handwrite letters of the alphabet? And so there, there are two different things that you can do. You can do an alphabet task, which is basically you ask students to write the alphabet from A to Z, lowercase, as many times as they can in one minute. Or you could actually have them copy a text. Um, so the phrase quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog actually has every single letter of the alphabet. So you could have them copy a, uh, a text like that repeatedly um, to try to look at um, some of their handwriting progress. And so they would just need lined paper and a writing utensil uh, and a timer and a quiet location. So for the alphabet task, they wouldn't see anything. You would just ask them to write the alphabet, whereas the copy task, they would need it printed someplace, either on the board or on, on the sheet. And then uh, the administration directions would be virtually, uh, virtually the same, uh, except uh, where the alphabet task is slightly different, alphabet in lowercase. And then here you would direct them to copy the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Okay. And then you would look for correct le legible letters. So what we mean by legible is that we're looking for letter formation. So the size, um, the intensity. I had some students that would, this is how they held a, a pen or a pencil. It's 
you know, just sort of between, just sort of between their hand like this. So they're intense, <laughs> they had some intensity issues. Um, spacing, whether the, the letters are just all clustered together, uh, the shape of them, um, direction, alphabetic knowledge. So particularly on the alphabet task, it lets you spot whether or not students know the letters of the alphabet. Um, I've definitely administered this task to some early elementary grade kiddos and also some middle school kiddos, um, particularly uh, some, I've had some students with intellectual disabilities to where um, they were missing some of the letters or LMNOP was just sort of like the squibble line. And I asked them what that letter was and they go, oh, you know, LMNOP. I'm like, oh, okay, that's, <laughs> that's actually like a bunch of different letters. Um, but the way they learned it is just sort of a cluster all together. And then you can also look for speed. Um, so uh, we won't have time to practice this together, but let's say if uh, this is what the student produced in a minute. So just looking off the bat, um, there are some issues here. So letter sequence. So they have L, M, N, O, P, Q, and then it looks like they're missing R. Um, or maybe they were trying to do that here. I'm not sure. Uh, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then... Looks like it just got out of sorts here. Uh, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. So uh, letter sequence could be an issue for this student. So that means they just might need some instruction on letter names, even uh, regardless of whether or not they can handwrite it. Um, it looks like some format and size issues. So this F, uh, or I'm sorry, formation and size. This F uh, is probably could be a little cleaner. Um, and then same with this M. Um, so you could look at it through a lens like that and spot specific uh, difficulties. Uh, for this kiddo, we could give them 36 correct letters in one minute um, if we give them credit for the F and M and just say, oh, that's close enough. Um, again, with all these rules, you just want to stay consistent um, with whatever you decide. And then you could establish local norms. Again, that's preferable. You could also use norms from research. These norms are getting a little dated. so. Um, but at least for right now, this is what we'd see for the, this is for the alphabet task. Uh, for whatever reason, this is one of the more enduring uh, differences we see in research is that there's a persistent difference between boys and girls on, on writing. Um, girls um, tend to score higher on writing measures, including handwriting speed. Um, there's a variety of reasons people are thinking that might be the case. Um, but um, it's not entirely clear. But so, for example, if you have a fourth grader, um, on average, we're looking for students to write basically a letter a second, and it just sort of increases. First grade, about one letter every three seconds, roughly. Okay, so that brings us to the end. So again, you can uh, download um, this presentation and handouts today. Um, we have the, the PowerPoint from today, we have story starters. I also posted a um, hopefully helpful guide. Let's see, oops. Uh, it'll be a guide to, that provides further scoring instructions um, that could be helpful. So let me bring that up real quick. There you go. So if you look at, this is from Inter Intervention Central. Uh, Dot org. Um, so this provides some further directions on scoring details, particularly for CWS. So that's on there. Um, also, uh, if you are really interested in doing a deep dive on this, there's a really great book called The ABCs of CBM. So if you just literally Google ABCs of CBM, this will be the first thing that comes up. Uh, the newest edition is a 2016. It's by Haas, Pasp, and Howell. They walk through everything you need to know from administration uh, to scoring um, to interpreting the scores um, in much more detail than, than we could go over in an hour and a half. And then also, um, I love working with schools. So if you're interested in establishing a partnership, I'm more than happy to talk with y'all. Um, if you're a special education teacher or an administrator or principal, um, what I typically do is help uh, schools set up a CBM monitoring system. So if they are interested in sort of establishing some of those local norms. Um, and lately I'm getting into typed. So using these same measures, but also assessing uh, students to do it via typing, particularly during uh, this time of remote instruction, that's been a greater emphasis. Um, and then also 
uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, all my contact information is on my Twitter. There's my email address. Um, and then, yeah, and, and then we have a couple more minutes. So I'm more than happy to stay on here for a couple minutes if you have any individual questions. Uh, but if not, uh, I loved working with you all. And we have, uh, I'm presenting next week. Um, and that one is the sister presentation of this to where I look at if a student is struggling, let's say on the CBMWE, what's an intervention you can try. If they're struggling on the CBM picture word at the sentence level, what's an intervention you can try. So I have that coming on next week. But thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Sean. In the chat, I have um, linked the form for the PD certificate if you'd like to fill that out. And Amelia, thank you for reminding everybody we're offering the session again in February. If you haven't already registered for uh, the 17th, I put that link in the chat. And Sean, we just can't thank you enough. All the examples and then the practice opportunities were super helpful. So we appreciate it immensely. Oh, awesome. Thank you all so much for working with me. I, again, like I said, I, it's, uh, I attended these PD sessions too as a teacher, so I know uh, it can be tiring, particularly when you're uh, working during the school day to do these, but uh, I love working uh, with you all. And um, it's uh, there's nothing like uh, teachers, particularly um, now. Um, I think uh, society, if they haven't shown it in their pocketbook, certainly they, they've sort of shown it through um, just when I talk with parents and just they're realizing how much work y'all are doing. So as a father myself, I, I, I thank y'all so much.